You are listening to Policy Currents, a weekly podcast from the Rand Corporation. I'm Evan Banks. And I'm Emily Ashenfelter. Every Friday, we bring you new insights from Rand's latest research and commentary. It's March 18th. Russian President Vladimir Putin has taken aggressive actions to prevent his people from knowing the truth about his war in Ukraine. According to RAND experts, increasing the access that Russian citizens have to information about what's actually happening on the ground may be key to ending the war sooner rather than later. And there are steps that the West could take to help, not by creating fake social media accounts, spreading disinformation, or simply disseminating pro-Western messages, but by supporting the spread of accurate news and information about the war and its costs. First, the U.S. and others could get out of the way of those in Ukraine and elsewhere who are applying innovative methods to inject information into the Russian market. For example, the U.S. could help amplify the Russian language messages coming from Ukrainian information operators. The U.S. could also ensure that Ukrainians retain the ability to disseminate online content. Second, there may be opportunities to support online personalities and influencers who have access to the Russian social media market. Third, the U.S., the EU, NATO, and civil society groups could explore creative ways to promote Russian access to independent Russian-language media, Ukraine-based websites, or Western-funded media, such as Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Fourth, the West could help Russians gain access to the free Internet, possibly through sharing access to virtual private network technologies. Efforts such as these could help neutralize the Kremlin's information operations, helping the Russian population stay focused on the true cause of Western sanctions and the true cost of Putin's war. On Wednesday, in a virtual address to Congress, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asked the U.S. yet again to declare a no-fly zone over his country. U.S. leaders have resisted taking this step. Their argument is that a no-fly zone policy is not a passive measure. It would involve shooting down Russian aircraft and attacking Russian air defenses. It is, in effect, war. And given that Russia is a nuclear adversary, many believe that a no-fly zone should not be considered a viable option. American policymakers are right to be hesitant, says Rand's Raphael Cohen, but it could be a strategic mistake to take a no-fly zone off the table. And here's why. First, Putin is expected to double down on his aggression. So whatever atrocities have been committed already, it could be much worse in the coming weeks. And Putin has already threatened using nuclear arms. In other words, While there should be a high threshold for the U.S. and its allies to ever risk direct confrontation with Russia, at this point, the U.S. can't be guaranteed that Russia won't cross that line. Second, the West tries to draw a bright line between indirect confrontation, providing weapons and economic sanctions, and direct conflict. But Putin may not view the situation the same way. Cohen considers this question from the Russian perspective. If an American missile shoots down a Russian aircraft, would it matter whether an American or a Ukrainian pulls the trigger? Third, a no-fly zone undoubtedly incurs significant risks, but there are several steps on the escalatory ladder between that and World War III. Escalation is certainly possible, but both sides may still have an incentive to keep the conflict limited to Ukraine, if only to avoid mutual annihilation. Fourth, by ruling out a no-fly zone policy now, the U.S. could lose potential leverage for a future settlement with Russia. And finally, there's the question of global strategic precedence. The U.S. is entering a new and more dangerous period, and many of its adversaries are or will soon be armed with nuclear weapons. If the U.S. rules out options, like a no-fly zone policy, as a matter of course, then it could send a powerful signal to nefarious actors that possessing nuclear weapons can serve as a shield from American military action. For these strategic reasons, senior administration and congressional leaders may want to consider keeping a no-fly zone policy on the table, Cohen says, even if they never actually implement it. Quote, 
The only thing worse than implementing a no-fly zone may be ruling it out entirely. Pain conditions are the leading cause of disability among active-duty U.S. service members. This has serious implications for both service member well-being and U.S. force readiness. That's why the military health system has made it a priority to provide service members with the highest quality treatment for pain conditions. A new RAND study looks at many different aspects of how the military health system treats acute and chronic pain, including the use of opioid prescribing. Here are some key findings. Service members with chronic pain are a large population with complex health care needs. Nearly 100,000 service members experience chronic pain in a given year. Nearly 80% of service members with acute low back pain receive treatment consistent with stepped care, a model that recommends less intensive treatments prior to prescribing opioids. Overall, opioid prescribing was largely consistent with recommended guidance. However, few service members with opioid use disorder received recommended medication treatment. The study also provides recommendations to help the military health system continue to improve pain care for service members. These include selecting a set of quality measures to routinely monitor pain care and report the findings, increasing the delivery of recommended non-pharmacologic therapies for pain, and increasing medication treatment for service members with opioid use disorder. A new RAND study finds that among safety net health clinics in California, the use of audio-only telehealth visits persisted long after the pandemic hit. In fact, many safety net clinics, which primarily serve low-income populations, were still relying on audio-only telehealth for many of their services 18 months after the start of the pandemic, longer than in other types of healthcare settings. Because little is known about the quality of audio-only telehealth, the higher rates of these visits in safety net clinics raise questions about the quality of care for low-income patients. If too many visits are occurring via telehealth, says lead author Lori Usher-Pines, it's likely that patients will miss out on needed preventive care, such as vaccinations or the opportunity to detect issues early in a physical exam. But... How much telehealth is too much? We just don't know at this point in time, she says. That's why it's important to increase efforts to study the effect of audio-only visits on the quality of medical care, as well as how audio-only telehealth might fit into a hybrid model of care, where patients receive a mix of telehealth and in-person visits. Additionally, these health centers need resources, time, support, and staffing to successfully implement all types of telehealth services. Earlier this month, Yoon sung yeol was elected president of South Korea. How might a new leader reshape dynamics in the region? According to Rand's Soo Kim, Yoon's position on one particular issue, North Korea, provides some insights. Yoon views his predecessor's policies of engagement toward North Korea as subservient, and has vowed to make a shift. He intends to emphasize North Korean denuclearization, stand up to Kim Jong-un, and put the Seoul-Pyongyang dynamic on a more equal footing. As part of his efforts to deal with the North Korean nuclear and missile threat, Yoon has pledged to normalize U.S.-South Korean joint military drills, which had been scaled down in recent years. Yoon also seeks to enhance America's extended nuclear deterrence and interoperability between the two allies. This is likely music to Washington's ears, while at the same time putting Beijing on pins and needles. Yoon's approach could bode ill for China and its efforts to maintain its, quote, long shadow of political and economic coercion over its neighbors. Although it's unclear what will happen next, the path that Yoon carves for Seoul in the coming weeks and months will be watched with keen interest, Kim says. RAND is a nonprofit institution that helps improve policy and decision making through research and analysis. For more on what we covered in this episode, check the show notes at rand.org/podcast. We'll see you next week.